The following presentation was recorded at the Buddhist Society of Victoria, Malvern East, Australia. Please visit our website at bsv.net.au. Today, I'm going to uh, share, along with a few pictures, now the reason for showing these pictures, which were taken during the time of the bushfires 10 years ago now, is to share um, these teachings on altruism, empathy and compassion. They often get merged together, they are often misused and uh, misunderstood. So I would like to share in light of showing uh, a few pictures where and how um, these aspects of compassion work well and where they don't. Um, now, do we have some capacity to... Yes, okay. There we go. Well, this may not be King Lake. I suspect this is a um, because we've had so many fires recently. Um, this may be a more recent one, but it is similar. It's just uh, it. I can't remember seeing this photo. Uh, um, yes, ten years ago, um, as in other other places in Australia and at this very moment in Townsville, uh, there was a very great disaster, as you all know, and it's been in the news a lot. So I won't go through the whole story. But some tremendous, uh, what we might say, altruistic, positive, uh, beneficial, aspects of people's kindness, generosity and capacity to be offering very good will out of a very difficult situation. It somehow, when there a disaster arises, something within us, if you are part of that experience, something within us arises that is beyond us. The self is no longer of a great consequence other than during the, 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 the immediate uh, self-preservation, you might say. But the self is not so much a consequence of what is needed after a disaster, that people, humanity, come together and share that deep understanding of the value of what it is to be human and to be compassionate and kind and empathetic. And I experienced a lot of this uh, from the day after the fire, from the day of the fire even, the day, but the day after, that people became bigger than the insignificant, our insignificant human selves. And I wrote that in a poem, that this insignificant being that I see myself as is much more. And so, you know, this public spiritedness and uh, benevolence and philanthropic charitable human qualities that we all come, have come out. And in altruism, and I'll start with altruism. So we'll just, you know, this is the very day after actually I saw this scene. I didn't take this photo, but that people were coming out with no shoes. You know, it had been a hot day, everything was taken. And they're coming into a town and there's a car burnt in, right in the village. And the road into King Lake was like this for weeks, you know. So I showed pictures, I think, last year. House after house after house were just rubble. And there were always something 
that reminded you of the life and who was present in that place. But what I'm going to draw more on is what happens just after this fire or this disaster. And true altruism, if it is real altruism, it is something that spontaneously arises in a very natural way. It arises out of the, the connection to suffering and pain, where self is no longer, you know, what divides, but we respond in a way that is always for the benefit of the other. And one woman who was um, speaking the other night, we've had a week of, of memorials and wonderful events, and a woman who had wrote, written a book, in about three days she wrote a book, came out years later, uh, and was very cathartic and healing for her. And she said, she ran out of the house while it was burning, had no time to gather anything, got in her car, looked at King Lake burning, and thought, well, the only way out, other way out is down that road, that way. And she went down Eucalyptus Road, which would have been the way I would have gone if I thought I could go, with a whole number of other cars, and then suddenly remembered she'd forgotten her dog. And her instinct was to turn around, and she turned around to come back home to get her dog, not knowing what she'd left. Five minutes later, or ten minutes later, and a car pulled up in front of her, drove off his side, pulled in front of her, got out and said, you can't go back. She said all the other cars had just raced down the hill. One thought beyond himself. She said she has no recollection of the face, the person, other than that act of altruism. No. And uh, she turned around and had to say goodbye to her dog. By the next day, there were people coming to the village with food because there was nothing. And I... Um, the next day, actually, I had gone home thinking I'd come out, thinking my house would burn. I had gone back home at five o'clock in the morning to see if it was still there, and then to realise as spot fires began again around the house, it was going to burn. So I carried my Buddha out on my belly, a Buddha that would take three people to carry out. <laughs> I carried it out. You have this empowered strength, put many books and important things in a bag and I went back to the village and as I'm going back to the village I'm thinking of two people I know will be fighting their fires on their own. And I got into town and I said I have two people I have to see, all the roads are blocked. And I said one is in King Lake in Pheasant Creek and the other is down Slide Hill and the fireman said, you can't go to Pheasant Creek. The road is totally blocked with cars who didn't make it into the town. Many people died there. But you can, I will come with you to your friend down Slide Hill. And with me and the Buddha strapped in the passenger seat, we drive down and I've got a big truck, fire engine behind me, and we go to my friend, and she had sat all night. She had been up all night fighting her fire, putting out the embers. Everything was burning. All the posts on the veranda was burning. The veranda was, itself was burning. The shed was burning, but she had saved her house. And her face was raw red. Her eyes were coming out. And uh, the firemen put out a few fires. And I put her to bed with some tea, some soup and tea, and uh, waited till she went to sleep. And then other neighbours and friends came. And I remember then I left the village for a day. I left the mountain. I found I could leave the mountain, so I continued down that road. 
and knowing that I have to gather resources in any way I can. So I mobilized the communities, the Chinese Buddhist communities. I think I was the chair of the Buddhist Council. No, not then, I was the chair of the Sangha Association. So I, I knew many of the Buddhist communities. So I asked various communities, could they get certain goods? So the Chinese got the white goods, the Vietnamese got clothes, work clothes and, and, and tools like shovels and others got food and we bought a lot of it up in truckloads. I had to come up with wristbands on to bring trucks up and we came up with truckloads of food and offerings, clothes and offerings to these centres and then we went around as did others to all the, they had little places where people could collect things and I would go and talk to the service people and and bring what I could whatever they wanted um, this was white goods that we took to all the different places and to Flowerdale and Marysville and Marysville was uh, you know completely closed off uh, but the police let us through it was totally devastated, shops half burnt, houses burnt to gr the ground. There were prob probably still bodies there. And we took a lot of things. We had many trucks, I bought many trucks up with food and goods. And then it was the time to start to listen. Now, for altruism, and this will go further into um, what I... I call um, empathy, but uh, I will touch on this in a the moment. There is an underground, you might say, to altruism where, you know, people have a very good intention. They have a good idea, even in business. It's often seen as being profitable to be altruistic, but you know, there is this underlining, self-serving reason for doing it. And in time, that can become pathological. It will become quite, um, quite harmful, despairing, destructive. And the pathological... Um, Altruism, as it's said in the Oxford Dictionary, is harmful deeds, codependency. It can lead to suicide, martyrdom, genocide. They start with altruistic intentions of helping, with compassion, and one's in one's own group. However, this altruism becomes fixed, fixated, singular leader focused who has, you know, not wisdom or compassion at the, at the seed. And what it will lead to is fatigue, a sense of having to serve, um, trying to fix situations, trying always to do the right thing, needing social approval, you know, all these are the underlying reasons where without real wisdom and compassion, you see a lot of people come to disasters with all these self-serving reasons to do good. And I saw a lot of it. But in real altruism, that leads to real empathy, which is not about just what often people think is that, you know, you become that person's feelings or you, you know, you embody that person. And that is not actually good, helpful empathy. And it doesn't come from uh, clarity with altruism either. But, you know, 
in the in the he healthy side of altruism, it requires this deep listening. It requires a meditative mind that opens, just as we do in meditation, in pause, in awareness, in the capacity to be with that person, to in a way embrace them, but not become that suffering. And this is where a lot of people in the health professions, a lot of people who work in, um, in churches or work in environments where they are looking after a lot of people burn out and them, they themselves become very ill or very weak from the work they are doing. Often in path, uh, pathological altruisms that start with good intentions, the donated funds and services that are poured in with the good will of others, they are spent carelessly. And I discovered in, in this bushfire, oh, this is coming into the empathetic aspect, that enormous amount of goodwill was poured out by people. But where did those funds go? There wasn't transparency. There was enormous amount of, uh, you might say do-gooders, but people who come, who get a little card to come up and and they're going to help everybody and they're going to, you know, fix situations. And many people did wonderful work and did tremendous service. But those whose altruism is not of pure intent tend to be so self-motivated or their organization is so self-motivated it is trying to attract followers at a time that people are needing support. It is trying to gather power or gather influence with governments and so they're looking for government grants and you know so I, I worked in areas um, where you know, a lot of, <laughs> look very miserable there. This is the fact of listening. And this is a, my point here is to talk about <laughs> where empathy is not quite right. <laughs> I'll, go, I'll move to the other soon. Um, and so people come with, I think often quite naive, quite innocent, or even pathological intention. And I saw so much of this. I think there is, uh, they have become aware of these problems um, and they try to regulate it better. But I'm not sure we'll have to wait till, till I experience that here again. But every time there is a disaster, the governments are never prepared. The bodies that can help are never prepared. And you would think that we would have a very, very clear structure on how to move in with not only the right intention, the right altruism, and the professional people who have the capacities and the know-how. But you know, we had no psychologist for over a month. We had no counsellors. We had very insufficient medical assistance. We had no knowledge that it wasn't really too healthy about, you know, going through all the, the dirt around your property to, to look for old possess possessions. So there was very little information. And now, as I read or heard, the other day, the fuel is back to 80% of what it was at that time. We have more issues coming. So 10 years on, has it changed? Have we learned? 
Yes, in many ways and no in other ways. Yes, I think with the local people who have grown through this situation, many have left, the majority in King Lake in fact, and those who have stayed have worked very hard together to grow systems and, uh, and cultures that are very helpful for one another. Um, I worked for five years on a whole variety of uh, working King Lake um, very solidly and I will come up into the empathy here. Um, and I learned many things, so I'm very grateful for that opportunity really in life to have been part of this. But again back to that expectation, that uh, that view that, you know, one answer fits all, or one person's experience will work for everybody. We found this is not the case. So where empathy, and this is my friend Fran, who I wanted to go and see, and they wouldn't let me come at that time, but I did get to see her a few days later and she's telling me her story that day and I'm listening. And you can see I'm totally immersed in her feelings and her story that, you know, my own capacity other than to listen was, uh, of course, limited. I had very little to offer other than I did go and get her all the basic physical needs that she needed and uh, I, I went back every day to see how she is going and contacted her and a number of other people, there are many other people that uh, it was necessary to visit at that time on a daily basis. Because people were so shocked and so uh, inexperienced with how to deal with shock and disaster in their lives that they were immobile, they could not do anything. We had the, um, the large memorial in the city and the various um, interfaith priests were invited and I was offered to, asked to offer a prayer. But I realised that, you know, with empathy, which is about affinity and support and, and, and uh, you know, that sensitivity towards others, that it was important to identify clearly with awareness what was really needed. And this is where a lot of the services come in. There are those who are looking to offer practical solutions. A thousand dollars was given out to everyone on the first day. <laughs> And if you stayed off the mountain for a week, you got 5,000. Those who stayed on the mountain and worked to save neighbours' properties, because the fires continued for a week, have got nothing, you know. So you have these issues that arose between neighbours. And the empathetic way I found to both cognise what is happening in that moment between myself and other people was to be present and listen. To take in what was not spoken. Not to just take in the pain, to acknowledge the pain, to acknowledge the, the difficulties, but to see what is able, what am I able to do here? What am I able practically to do? What am I able to do by hearing their story. Where do I intervene or want to say something or not say something? So I found it took a little while from, you know, just sitting and taking in the pain to realise this is not so beneficial, neither for them or myself. 
There is another aspect of empathy which is called moral suffering. It is where we start to disrespect and abuse power struggles or we pour judgment or determine, determine views and uh, we feel our actions are righteous so we should be doing them. You know, all these sort of um, expecting others to take our command or others to do what we want, you know, is a very self-interested. I'll, I'll be here providing, you know. And I found some of the charities, even Buddhist charities, were very interesting. They came in, I took them up the mountain and they wanted to go to see the people who'd lost a lot and made a lot of promises. And here's people telling their stories. And all the time they're clicking photos and uh, taking videos, you know, giving a blanket. And I was up in Queensland shortly afterwards at a conference and invited to give a talk at one of these charities. And there I saw myself on this massive screen that had gone all over the world with the story of King Lake. Money was poured into that organisation from all over the world. And nothing came to King Lake. Very little. They promised the CFA a truck. They promised a building at the neighbourhood house and I negotiated all these meetings. I was <laughs> six months of negotiating meetings right to the tops of the levels and then an apology at the end. We can't, you know, the headquarters have said no. And I, I actually put in a complaint that, you know, here is my face going around the world un <laughs> unasked. <laughs> And a Buddhist organization could do this. This is where it can bring a lot of moral distress and suffering upon others. There were so many complaints about it around. I was a little embarrassed to be Buddhist for a while there. <laughs> because they would come to me in the middle of the street and say, how could this happen? And I would again have to listen my head down, accepted. I was part of it, I was there. I was negotiating with them. <laughs> There's also the, um, you know, this ethical violation is based in self-delusion. It's based in a greed and corruption. And it's, at its core, is wrong speech, it's lying. And it is so prevalent. It is so prevalent in disaster, on every level. It was hard to sit in meetings. Now I became, uh, some of these people here are people who are, um, holding official positions, you know, for the council or for the government. And you can probably tell the King Lakeians we all look <laughs> a little bit, <laughs> a little bit not wanting to be in this photo, I think. Um, but we became, we were voted in actually to be this first King Lake Rangers representative community group. So we had to represent the community for government. For, 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 you know, what the community wanted. And we worked very hard. And what we found is we often would, we had this very big meeting. I don't think I've got a picture of it. Oh yes, Remake Day, the King Lake Remake Day. Um, I designed these little posters and I did that for a year as well. And we um, <clears throat> gathered the, all the community who could come to see what it is they felt the community needed and identified all the, the listed all the uh, objectives and how they could be uh, funded and how much they'd cost. And then I, myself and a couple of other people compiled a great big journal of this work, 
which is still floating around on government sites. Unfunded. <laughs> we're, all, we're all promised at least our telephone uh, payments, but we were volunteers. For three years I worked on this committee, sometimes four or five meetings a day. And uh, in the very beginning, many meetings a day. And so the thing was, we saw so much of this ethical violations and that was creating empathetic stresses in the further empathetic stresses in the community. And meeting after meeting, the factions were growing for and against. Whatever we were proposing, there would be a group against it. And, you know, to this day, I've never seen any of those people in King Lake again. <laughs> but, you know, there was... Um, there was amongst this body of people who were working very hard, tremendous amount of compassion. We developed, a, a few of us developed this um, meal every day. I talked to Craig Lapsley, he was head of the fire and Christine Nixon at the time, and we were funded to, to offer food every day and um, various chefs came up to cook and the rest of us volunteered, you know, in different capacities to serve. So I, every week, twice a week, I served food, two or three times a week, or went to get extra, um, uh, extra food from off the mountain. And this was a, a community's together action. I remember Sung Sung Sanim used to always talk about this together action, doing something together. And together we did a lot. It allowed people living in caravans and sheds or in a, a room that was left on their unburned house or in their houses where they were the only house in the street or where they were feeling communally isolated to come together and share a meal and talk. And uh, it, we did this for two years and then the one of the churches took over and still does it once, e once, um, once a week. And I want to lead this into compassion. We, um, I organised for a 49 death ceremony to take place in the big Chinese temple in King Lake West. And um, the venerable, various venerable in Victoria came to offer chanting and to help and then we were able to, you know, there were people there who had lost limbs, lost family, you know, had lost, um, you know, parents or family who had lost their family had come up. There were all the services came. I had raised um, 200,000 by giving talks in the, in the Vietnamese temples. And so we divvied this up to offering, you know, between three and 5,000 to all the services. I think we gave 10,000 to the neighbourhood house, but all the services got $5,000. So the CFA, the SES, all the services, the ambulance, and um, they all came to receive this gift. So it was a very, very wonderful thing. It happened very soon after which we didn't expect so many people to come, but a few hundred people came and um, it was, it's still remembered till this day. And the Vietnamese provided the food, others provided different, um, yeah, different services and they had a big, um, a big blessing for those who had passed away. Um, that was done in a very uh, traditional Buddhist way and there were um, gifts for the children. There's quite a lot of monks and nuns. Christine Nixon presented a talk and a very good friend. She, um, <laughs> that's a funny photo, I know. <laughs> I'll tell you about that. <laughs> and she, uh, well, she, be, she was a wonderful woman. We really enjoyed Christine, but she was also very ill-informed about 
what could be done and what how to proceed. But she came to our meetings and we all would discuss many things. I want to touch on compassion here uh, because compassion has many forms and all these tremendous efforts that were being done were if were done they were done in the light of compassion it is not something that you get tired or you get burnt out it is something that develops enormous amount of joy within you this is the difference with empathy when you have clear knowledge about how to empathize or how empathy works then empathetic empath this empathetic joy and compassion work together as we know from the buddhist teachings and um compassion however is a little bit more of a you know something that we develop through our cognitive thinking process you know it is something that we work through that we develop through our practice our meditative practice and altruism in its highest and empathy in its purest and compassion all work together and then with wisdom it it has the right direction and the right actions and here I was just uh, I I mention here that in the Theravada, compassion is very aligned with metta, loving kindness. In the Mahayana, it is more aligned. It comes from the Sanskrit word kram, which means to do. So this is where in the Mahayana and the Zen traditions, the action becomes very important. It means to do, to make, to act, in accord with care. To diminish the suffering of others, this is it's official. It's sometimes uh, translated as com compassionate action, but it is uh, where it is not translated um, completely correct, in, uh, correctly is where it is used um, as a sympathy or willingness to bear the pain of others. This is actually an incorrect translation but often you will see that in Mahayana Buddhism I mean a great Bodhisattva has that great capacity one who is very developed and has great skillful means can indeed bear but most of us are not at that stage um, and compassion draws as I said from this cognitive but it draws its skillful means through a training a training through the empathy, a training in compassion, uh, a training in compassionate actions. So people who work in helping others, usually now for spiritual care, in hospice, in medical systems, the doctors and the nurses and those in caring professions have a clear guideline and training process so they know how to act in a way that is beneficial and not neglecting, not taking away, not hurting another. Even in hospitals we sometimes see neglect, we sometimes see abuse and hurt through that neglect. We all know about it. A very wonderful teacher who has inspired me recently is a, a woman by the name of Joan Halifax. I've known her many years, but this book that she wrote called Standing on the Edge, and here she is exploring where fear and power meet. And in she's using these five uh, psychological territory she calls edge states. We've talked about the first uh, two here. And the others are integrity, respect and engagement along with compassion. 
the others. I might talk about it in the next talk. But the book I found um, so important, I've already given it to two people who work in caring professions, because she goes and she quotes many wonderful people doing the right thing and how they've developed an understanding about what works. In my one of my jobs of um, being in this CRA, this K King Lake Rangers group, was environment. I was on an environment committee, and I was taken to the above King in King Lake West. There's what is called the aquifers. They were built by the Chinese 150 years ago. And they were the water, original water source for Melbourne. And around the aquifers, the, um, they grew many different varieties of trees, forests, little forests of all sorts of trees. It was a very beautiful place. And these were experiments to see which timbers would work the best for building in Australia. And that's where radiator pine became one of the main building timbers. So they had to look at the ones that grew quickly, that were strong, that grew straight, and then others that grew slowly. And I'm standing in front, so it burnt. And it burnt along with, um, oh, with some very, very important buildings um, that had been the historical buildings that had been in this site. But it's not if it's off limits to people normally, but I was able to go and, um, and research in this area. And what I found, because it, it started the work that I did for the next um, year, which was to look at what timbers are okay to fell post fires because I was taking everything, you know, there was, there were all the timber, this was another aspect, all the people who were reaping millions off the, cutting down all the trees. And so I created a, um, <laughs> this was on a, a newspaper with an article I wrote, I created a, a forum so this, this tree is a, is a grey gum. It would have come back to life. There were three grey gums on this property, hundreds of years old, and they got in and cut it down. And we tried, I spent four days trying to stop them, talking to councillors, talking to government, talking to arborists all over Victoria to stop these trees being cut down. And the man who owned the property, it was on his property, he was trying to prove it's his property. The council came in and said, no, it's half on ours. So the, the, the councillor had, they'd put someone in council in this area that was, again, somebody who was uh, uh, self with self-interest, who had created a group with an arborist and a few others who were profiting by this. And so we were fighting this, and I created this. Um, oh, this is with people who were taking around. Oh, I don't seem to have it. I created this. Um, oh, it's not there. This poster called "Our Trees No More," and I put it around town, and I invited people to come and discuss this issue of of harvesting all the timber post fires, because much of it would come back. Yes. The ash, uh, the ash, uh, eucalyptus ash wouldn't generally regenerate well, um, and we understood that that they that's important. They could cut those, but they weren't just after that timber; they were after a lot of very good timber. And um, and so, in creating this forum to bring together the councillors, to bring together the public, to bring together the arborist, and talk about it. Is this the right way to do it? People have already suffered with losing their homes. And here you are, five, one week later, two weeks later, coming in to cut the trees around them. So that was my, my job. And um, 
it, it brought in three to four hundred people came to the meeting. They were down outside the hall. And, uh, and I stood up, I introduced the meeting and I stood up and I said to the council, are you aware how much is being removed? And the main councillors were not because they had put all that power into one little person who was down a few tears. They had, you know, they were not aware. And so as so many people came out, there were quite a number of meetings to decide, well, how do we proceed with this? And it happened that they agreed that when the arborists went to check and mark the trees in the morning, that local people could come with the arborist and he had to talk through why they would cut that tree and why they wouldn't. Several arborists came and said that is definitely a grey gum. Why has that been cut? Why did the arborist say you could cut that tree? And so because of this, I went out then for another year Every second morning, there were four of us to see which trees the arborists would cut and not cut. And we would say, well, what about just cutting the limb for this year? You know, you don't need to cut it. It's not going to fall down. They would have just cut it, you know. And so we saved many trees by doing that. And also the community were very happy, very, very happy. And... Um, you know, so this was another little effort that I was able to do. I had the time. I mean, I started to suffer five, six years after the bushfires and probably still suffering now. But at that time, I had the strength and I had the clarity because I meditated. I lived in a forest. I was very lucky only part of my forest burnt, but I still had a house. So I had many benefits and I was able to sit on many committees more in a mediating way, you know, keeping them quiet and functioning. <laughs> committees get very, <laughs> very overactive. Joan Halifax says, meditation can assist us in cultivating attention and emotional balance developing moral character and nourishing insight, all of which are necessary for principal social action. And this is what it is, principled social action, wise, methodical, careful social action. Without these qualities being strong within us, we are at risk of harm, harm to ourselves and harm to others, and can cause great suffering. Viewing ourselves as a saving, fixing and helping others in whatever situation, we can feed our latent tendencies of power and even deception, especially within ourselves. Many have left the mountains now and it is our choice to stay or go Many have worked very hard to rebuild their lives and their homes and their community. And the towns are, are growing slowly. King Lake is one of the slower ones. But beyond the handouts, or the lack of them, and beyond just the bricks and mortar, just the possessions and our physical spaces. It is important that I know who I am in this place, at this time, and what it is I am doing. Whether you are in disaster, and disaster can be in the home, you know, it can, disaster can be right here at any moment. My nephew had who moved down with his family recently from Townsville, had two houses in Townsville. And I, I was calling him every few hours, is your house underwater yet? 
and uh, he was very lucky, you know. Um, he thought one was underwater, but he was very lucky that they were on a little bit higher ground. And he said, actually, the views we got was from one side of town. But it doesn't take a lot. You know, when you think you've got a dam behind a town, there is always a possibility that <laughs> the dam gates are going to break or be opened. It it's bewilders me how that can happen. but. They are now suffering very greatly. So if you can offer a little in some way, without expectation, without regret, it is a wonderful thing to do. That is the altruistic intention. Not that I, a lot of people said, oh, I gave so much and the government did this and this. And for the next... Two years, you know, they're upset because what they, they gave was misused. <laughs> that is not the point of my talk. But the point is, when we do give, we give it from the generosity, from the kindness, from the empathetic, from the altruistic, and from the compassionate mind. So thank you, and thank you for listening. Sorry to bring up the bushfires again, but this will be the last of it, hopefully. <laughs> Is there any questions? We might have five minutes. Yes. You beautifully described the behavior of the human mind at a time of uh, community crisis. Yes. Uh, the important thing is how the human minds behave um, at that time. Uh, that is spontaneous, you use the word spontaneous altruism, spontaneous compassion, spontaneous loving kindness. Mm. But uh, what happens afterwards is if the people are not developed in their minds, mm. at the end of the crisis, mm. those defilements come back exaggerated. Absolutely. Mm. That's, I mean, That's leading the to post trauma yeah, stress yeah, disorder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The jealousies, anger, yeah. envy. Hatred, all this come back. Big That's time. right. Yeah. So this is what you described that yeah. very clearly how it happens. Yeah. That's a yeah, <coughs> that's a very important point. It's actually I must have missed it. <coughs> um, when you know these these uh, qualities are not founded through the depth of practice and have, that's why the structures are in place um, for dealing and working with people in crises. You know, you now have to train to be able to go. I mean, a lot of people do superficial training. I think it should be a lot more. But you should be well trained to go into these places because it will affect you afterwards and it will come back as a trauma for you. And it will come back, you'll regret, you'll have guilt, and you'll have sorrow. So, you know, it is so important for all of us to be aware of, you know, our strengths and, and our limitations. Mm. Good. Any more? Yes. Chikong, you did um, say that uh, you had sufferings years after this um, situation. Can you describe how you feel now about it? Um, well, actually, the first few years, I, I didn't. I just was there doing what was needed. I had that capacity. Um, uh, about after about six, seven years, or oh, six years, I think I started to notice. Pe friends were saying, Jiguang, you okay? Oh, yeah, I'm fine, you know. <laughs> but I started to notice my energy had waned a lot. And I was starting to get a little bit sick and, uh, and tired. And also I was doing a lot of other Buddhist work too. So during this time I was still doing those other things, but... I focus more on King Lake. So then I came back to focus more on my Buddhist work and I was building a little hall and things. Um, I would still go to meetings, but I found I would be just, you know, sitting back more in a mediator or offering where it was really important to offer because I found after years of doing this, 
that there were a lot of going around in circles, you know, where people were putting in so much effort and doing a lot of research, you know, I've got research like this. And then anyone in governments know this, you know, you're doing a lot of work and then it comes to nil. And I've just even been on a committee this last year and all the work we did for one year gets taken by the government in another direction. So always there is this uh, part of myself that, talking about feelings, you know, that uh, I see I can hold those feelings, allow them to be there more. So when I sit at home and I, I notice, wow, that was interesting or frustrating or I hold those feelings, I don't push them away. I really stay with them and, and I, I experience what that is quite deep in myself. I allow those feelings to take me into meditation because I know they are things that are buried not recognized, not acknowledged from back during the trauma that are still arising. If not, I'm picking up in an empathetic way others or, or group issues or community issues. And negativity feeds negativity. We all know that. So it is so important that when we have these feelings that we we don't sit on them, we acknowledge them. And we acknowledge them for what they are. It's very important to know what it is you're feeling. But the ultimate, they're just feelings. They're just thoughts. And they're not permanent. Whatever we add to them add, adds that permanency, that sense of something solid, something fixed, but they're not. And so I did find by staying with them for a while, they, they pass, you know, they go. They may come back and I may look at them again, see that face again, see that energy that surrounds it again. But I know they're not fixed. They just morphed, you know, they're all wanting attention. They're all wanting to say, you know, I'm Ji Guang. I'm this you know, I'm this person doing this, or I'm that person doing that, and I think this is right and that's wrong. You know, there is always that going on in us. But you have, the more you recognize it, the less deluded by it you are. Good. There was one other, yes, thank you. Thank you so much for your talk this morning. It was really important for me. I have struggled. I read a lot of Buddha's texts. I come and go out of these places and I often walk away thinking, it's just too nice. And it really bugs me. I'm a psychologist. I work with people every day and I have since I was 19 years old and I'm 68 now. Yeah. And I know that compassion fatigue involves um, it's somehow about being left with all of that, what you're talking about, that frustration. Yeah. That frustration with a system, with bureaucracy, with ego minds, where they're stuck in their particular yeah. people, are stuck in their agendas. And I guess, you know, we all yeah. have that to some degree. But for me, it's about that capacity to self-observe, isn't it? And to be able to, as you say, listen. Mm. But and listen to yourself. You know. Yes, listen to yourself, listen to the other, go away, sit with it, reflect on it, yeah. and, and evolve something out of that. But I think I've struggled with managing those feelings and having them named, and I want to name them when I feel angry, when I feel frustrated. Because yeah. <laughs> it, it actually fills up your whole body when you feel Absolutely. like that, when you see massive injustice. I work with sexual assault and family violence. Yeah, so I see yeah, a lot of that. Yeah. It's, it's really important to talk about it, I think, yeah, as absolutely. you say, and own it. Yeah. And I haven't heard it. You're the first person I've heard in a Buddhist environment talk about that in such an open way. So I'd like to thank you very much for that. Ah, thank you. Well, please get the book by Joan Halifax. It will be, it's so rich. 
it will give you a lot of insight to, to work with this. Um, I know, perhaps because, you know, I'm a little different to the Theravada monastic. Um, as many of you have known me, like Cora, for many years and Dr. Chai, you know, they understand my role in, in Buddhism's gone a little differently. It may not have gone this way had we not had the bushfires. You know, I might have just had a lovely little retreat and meditating and doing endless retreats. And it hasn't been that for me. And I understand what took me to King Lake now because this was very important for me to learn in this lifetime. You know, I had 20 years sitting on the mountain in Korea, studying Buddhism in a very traditional way, very thorough way, you know, five years of just textual study. It, it doesn't serve anyone here. I don't tend to meet people who want to understand Buddhism in that way. So when the bushfires came, although I gave a lot of retreats and it helps people for a little bit in their life and then they go off and never hear from them again, you know. When, it, when this happened, what happened for me is I realized these are all just human beings like myself. They're all suffering. They all have tremendous sorrow and pain here in this life. Enormous loss. Well, the anger comes later. You know, just after a bushfire, just after disaster, very interesting thing happens. Everyone's enlightened. I'm alive. And it doesn't matter how much they've lost, they're alive. And they hug everybody and they smile at everybody and they look you right in the face. And suddenly no one saw the bald head or the grey clothes. They just saw this open person they could embrace. And sometimes we forget about that. In psychology, we can get very psychological about the realm we live in. And something that happens in trauma is you become very grounded. There was a paragraph, I must have missed it, about the groundedness of altruism and empathy. You become very grounded on what's real and what's not. What's in that mind of those people have just walked out of a house that's gone with bare feet? A friend of mine with a baby, you know, six months old baby in her arms. They only got out because she did have bare feet in the house and felt the hot floor. Her husband and child had shoes on. And he had a full, he had a full <laughs> system of water pouring over the house. He was sure the house would be saved. She felt the floor hot. He looked underneath. The floorboards were burning from underneath. And they built a little, they had built a little, he built a little place. He was so proud of it, you know, um, to go to. Well, the fire went over. They got in there and she said they couldn't breathe because all the smoke was coming through the little hole. He hadn't built it well enough. But they only got to it, she said, because somehow the roof sprinklers sprayed a little arc over the path to it. They didn't even know that. She said we wouldn't even got to it. So how many families um, that I've heard a lot more in this last <laughs> week, families lost the whole family. It, it touched me when I was at the memorial the other day and they've got this beautiful um, memorial sculpture with the, all the names. And I didn't realise there were so many families lost. Whole families. Or at least half of them. Sometimes one of them were off, you know, the husband was at work or the wife was somewhere else. But these families, what happened in the case, like with one, there was a family, a grandmother and father and the two grandchildren, they had another two children and they had another uncle in one house. And the grandparents jumped out of the house and one of the sons, the grandsons, oh, the grandson had gone with the father, so they'd left the father's house, the parents' house, because they thought that was burning, came to the village thinking it would be safe. 
the grandparents jumped out and the kids were too frightened to jump out. They all died at the door. Another story was where a man said his wife got to the door with a baby in her arms and thought, it's too hot, I can't go out there, I'm dead. If I go out there, I'll perish, my skin will fall off. If I stay in here, I'm going to die. So she just stood at the door in a state ready to die. And the husband came and said, what in the hell are you doing? Get out. And it jumped her out of that state. And without thinking, she jumped out. And with the beautiful picture of her and her, two ki her three kids under a blanket between two tanks. Yeah, so that was such an interest. I read so many of these stories of how people became real. And I think what's really helpful is that we ground ourselves in the life we live, in the we, as I said, we choose to be in these places. You're choosing to do this work, to ground yourself in the life you live and make choices or give yourself some boundaries, how much you can take. And rather than do that empathy where you're taking on the feelings, becoming the other, space your mind as you do in meditation and it's this person in this big space, this room, in this house or this office or this clinic. And out there, there's a world of people just like this one in here. Take your mind out and do these practices that rather you over-connect, over-drain, over-empathize. Overexhaust yourself. Always sit and ground yourself. Put your feet, take yourself deep into the ground. And do meditation before you take on a client. Mm -hmm.